Uh, the title of the next presentation is Using Biotechnology to Restore the American Chestnut. And uh, I want everybody to give a warm welcome to Andy Newhouse uh, for holding the record travel the farthest to get here. And we're really pleased to have you here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed learning uh, more about your Ozark chinkapin. I uh, was not too familiar with that, but I've worked on uh, chestnuts for a while. So the starting quote here is just about uh, kind of the, the, the frequency that uh, American chestnuts were seen in eastern U.S. forests, and uh, how we're working to restore that. Before I get started too much on my science, I uh, just want to introduce myself. Uh, I have twins, they're about two and a half years old right now, so they're uh, always an adventure. And um, when I say I'm from New York, a lot of people think New York City, but uh, I live about in the middle of the state of New York, about a half hour outside Syracuse, which is a lot of woods and a lot of farms, and uh, I always enjoy being out in the woods whenever I can. So. <clears throat> On the science talk, I'll do my best not to put you to sleep. I have the right after lunch slot here, but um, <clears throat> here we go. Chestnuts, American chestnut. I will go pretty quickly through all the background stuff. You guys are pretty familiar with the chestnut story in general. Uh, American chestnuts can be, of course, eaten roasted, ground into flour, brewed into beer. Um, Important for wood, as you know, rock resistant, straight grains, all that. Uh, keystone forest species, uh, habitat, food for a lot of animals. And the trout is not in there as just a random example of wildlife. Uh, we're seeing some interesting connections throughout the ecology that I will uh, get into later. Um, of course, American chestnut is a big part of the heritage of the eastern U.S. But this sign is actually out in California. and. Uh, the professor I work with, uh, Bill Powell, uh, likes this particular example um, of uh, this intersection. But the, the chestnut has, has really become ingrained in our culture, even out on the west coast where it was not native. Of course, I've been familiar with that. Christmas song, um, and even uh, less obvious things. There's a park in Syracuse called Long Branch Park that was named for the spreading chestnut trees. So uh, just a very common through our culture. Historically, uh, these are some pretty famous pictures of just these massive trees. Uh, I've heard them called the redwoods of the east. Um, they were very common, very large. Uh, six to eight feet in diameter was not too unusual. Some of the biggest ones were up to 10 feet in diameter, 100 plus feet tall. Just really massive trees. <clears throat> Uh, could also be, if they were growing in open areas, they could uh, be, have more of a spreading form. So not necessarily just tall, tall and straight trees. Uh, this picture is in the 1980s. So American chestnuts are not extinct, just like chinkapins. They regrow from stump sprouts. The, the blight doesn't affect the roots. Um, <clears throat> but the few large survivors that are out there are probably just lucky. We don't have any evidence, I've never seen any evidence that there's actually an American chestnut that's resistant to the blight. Yeah, there are a few large ones out there, but they're just uh, either isolated enough or lucky enough or infected with a hypovirulent strain of the blight, like, uh, like has been mentioned earlier. But there's basically no natural resistance within uh, American chestnuts to the chestnut blight. <clears throat> this is a picture of a canker on one of our uh, our uh, stems in the field, uh, fungus growing on culture here. You're familiar with the background. Um, started in New York. Uh, the first introduction of chestnut blight, we suspect, was slightly before 1900, but it was first identified in 1904. So that's kind of the, um, the date that has been set, the first uh, uh, scientific <coughs> Uh, range the American chestnut throughout, uh, centered around kind of the Allegheny Mountains, the middle of the eastern U.S., a uh, little bit up into New York and New England, and down south, kind of bordering your, uh, your Ozark Chinkapin range. And of course, as the blight spread throughout the range of the American chestnut, it was very happy to just jump to your, uh, <coughs> to the Chinkapins around here. Uh, the chestnuts that are available today, you, you can buy chestnuts if you go online and, and you want to plant chestnuts in your yard. They're available, but most of what's available is going to be a hybrid chestnut. Um, the Chinese and European species um, 
are more common. Uh, it's certainly the Chinese and Asian species are resistant to the blight. The European are not quite as susceptible as American, but most of the European chestnuts are still, uh, still considered susceptible to the blight. Um, but most of what you buy is a hybrid between some of those, uh, some of those varieties. Uh, this one is called the most widely planted chestnut tree in America right now, this particular hybrid. And it's complicated. It's uh, American chestnut by several different varieties of Chinese chestnut. <clears throat> um, again, complex hybrids are freely available, but any of these hybrids or any of the straight Asian chestnuts don't have this, this tall forest or timber type growth. They don't tend to compete well in a forest where a, a tall straight growth is, is required. The efforts to bring back the American chestnut can be pretty well uh, uh, slotted into two main groups. First thing I'm going to talk about is not the program I worked with, but the American Chestnut Foundation's breeding program. And that is based on taking a Chinese chestnut tree and crossing it with an American chestnut tree. So the resulting offspring would be half Chinese and half American. You take that first generation hybrid and do what's called back cross it to an American chestnut. The offspring would be three quarters American. And so on until you get a tree that is about 15 sixteenths American chestnut and 1 16th <coughs> Chinese chestnut. And you take that, breed it with itself for a few generations. And the hope is that you'll get a tree that has generally the American chestnut characteristics that we like with the blight resistance from the Chinese chestnut. And this program has certainly had some success. There are some very good trees, but uh, there are limitations also, including it's, it's hard to predict from, a, gen, from a, a given generation or a batch of nuts. You don't know which ones are going to uh, have the, either the best American form characteristics or the best blight resistance characteristics. So uh, this, I certainly don't want to downplay this program, but um, this is, uh, and it's ongoing, it's continually improving. That's about all I'm going to say about the, the breeding program, and uh, I'm certainly happy to talk more about that later. Um, 16th Chinese chestnut. Now I'm going to compare the breeding program to our work with transgenic chestnuts. And we've been taking full American chestnuts and adding in just a couple of individual genes for blight resistance. So we know from uh, DNA sequencing that chestnut has about 45,000 genes. And uh, we like to compare that to a book that has about 45,000 words, so maybe a 200 page book. And if 1 16th of the genes are Chinese chestnut, that would be like 11 pages of the book being in Chinese. And so could you still read a book that had 11 pages in Chinese? Probably. But depending on where that, those 11 pages are, may or may not be critical to the, the plot line of the book. Um, this is a little excerpt here uh, from uh, Walden by Thoreau. It's very exciting at that season to roam the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln. And what we're doing with our transgenic program is adding about two genes. So that would be like adding two words to a book. It's no less American, or no less written in English. We add about two words. The then boundless blight resistant chestnut woods of Lincoln. <laughs> so, um, even though we're making very small changes, sometimes that can still result in changes to the tree as a whole. So. Uh, one of the analyses we've been doing is looking at what are called metabolites. These are small proteins that are uh, just formed by all trees. And then we want to compare these between different types of trees. So the first comparison we did here is looking at American chestnut and Chinese chestnut. And we looked at 112 metabolites. We didn't do this work in our lab. We were collaborating with someone at Oak Ridge National Lab. So we identified 112 metabolites. And of those 112, there are 39 of them that are present in significantly different quantities in Chinese chestnut compared to American chestnut. So about a third of these, these uh, metabolites are significantly different between American and Chinese chestnuts. Next, we looked at a, a first generation back cross, or a hybrid chestnut tree that should be about 3 quarters American. Um, and we see maybe an eighth, about 13 out of the 112 metabolites are different from American in a hybrid chestnut. When we look at our transgenic chestnut, there's one 
out of the 112 metabolites that showed up as different between our transgenic American chestnut and the non-transgenic American chestnut. And to dive a little deeper on that, that one metabolite that was different is called alpha-linoleic acid. It's an essential fatty acid. And our transgenic chestnut came out different than American chestnut. But if you look at the Chinese and hybrid chestnuts, it's about the same as our transgenic chestnut. So there's no change here that's different than what's already out there. And the difference from American chestnut is about 1.6 fold. The American chestnut has about 1.6 times as much of this uh, particular fatty acid. And that's the only difference that we found in this, uh, in this analysis. So to get into more of the kind of details of our transgenic program, <coughs> excuse me, when we're adding new genes, where do we get those genes, or how do we pick them? We're testing 33 or 34 different genes right now, uh, all separately, and uh, 21 of those came from the Chinese chestnut. Uh, six came from what's called a seguin Chinese chestnut, a different species in China. And we actually went to China a few years ago and uh, were able to collect samples from native wild Chinese chestnuts, and that was a pretty exciting trip. But that's enabled us to identify several of these genes. Uh, the complication with using individual Chinese chestnut genes for a project like this is that within the Chinese chestnut, they've identified at least three major <coughs> genes and several more minor genes that are all contributing to the blight resistance of the Chinese chestnut. So if we pick any one of those genes, it's very unlikely that that one gene will impart full blight resistance. So it might be possible, you know, combining several of these genes and then putting those genes into American chestnut. But it, that'll be a very complicated project <laughs> to identify those genes individually and then try them all separately, then try them in combination, and so on. Um, we have seen partially enhanced resistance from a few of the Chinese chestnut genes that we've tried, um, but nothing that, that allows full blight resistance. So the gene that we're looking most at comes from wheat, and um, it's called oxalate oxidase. I'm going to go into a lot more detail about that. But what we've seen is that this one gene from wheat can significantly enhance blight resistance in the American chestnut. Uh, in addition to wheat, this same gene is found in other cereal grains like uh, barley, rice, uh, corn, and a variety of other things like peanut, banana, strawberry. Similar genes are found in a wide variety of species, so they are um, uh, they're common genes, and uh, we're finding this one particular one from wheat is working very well. Um, before I explain more about that gene, I want to go into a little more detail about how chestnut blight works or how it affects the chestnut tree. And the fungus releases a compound called oxalic acid into the tree. And that's basically a toxin that kills American chestnut tissue just under the bark. And after this, this toxin kills the tissue, then the fungus eats it. Um, when, well, a lab, um, different lab than ours, modified the fungus, modified the cryphonectria fungus, so it doesn't produce this oxalic acid, and it's, it's called a knockout mutation. It uh, basically stops the fungus from producing this acid. When that's the case, it causes very little damage on a chestnut stem. It colonizes the uh, initial wound, but it basically doesn't spread out from that wound site. Um, so this would be, is like what you'd see in a Chinese chestnut, or possibly even oaks. Uh, the chestnut blight fungus can survive on an oak tree, but it doesn't typically cause any damage, and it just kind of hangs out there until the tree dies, at which point then it eats the dead tissue. Uh, we're seeing kind of the same thing when, when uh, there's no oxalic acid production on an American chestnut. And then, of course, the version of the full oxalic acid produces this big canker, a lot of damage on the, on the stem. Um, this is what kind of led us into, or got us thinking about the or, sorry, oxalate oxidase, which is an enzyme that breaks down oxalic acid. Um, basically, this, uh, since it doesn't kill the fungus, we don't really think of it as a pesticide. By some definitions, it might be, but it's not killing the fungus. It's detoxifying this, this acid that's produced by the fungus, and therefore protecting the tree. 
But that, that's a pretty interesting point because, well, a couple of reasons. First, it reduces the chances that the fungus will evolve and o overcome this, uh, this mechanism uh, because it's not killing the fungus. It's not providing what's called a selection pressure. Um, additionally, well, the, the, the summary of that is that we're basically changing the lifestyle of the fungus from a pathogen that actively kills the tree before it eats it to a saprophyte, which is a fungus, like I said, on oaks that tends to, it survives on the tree, but it doesn't actively kill the tree. It eats the dead tissue when it dies from something else rather than actively killing it. So this is, uh, seems really promising, and we've been able to uh, try this in a lot of trees. <laughs> Sorry, I went out of order here. The oxalate oxidase comes from wheat, and uh, Everyone eats wheat. We had oxalate oxidase for lunch today, and um, the few people who are concerned about gluten um, need not be concerned about oxalate oxidase. We know that it's a completely separate protein from uh, anything related to gluten. Uh, it is, uh, we are confident it is not an allergen. We've done a couple of kind of database searches for known allergens, and the oxalate oxidase doesn't even show up. It's, it's not remotely related to anything that's known as an allergen. Um, the fact that it's in wheat and so ubiquitous in food products might make it easier for us to, uh, to or slightly easier for us to go through the regulatory process. And I have, um, I'm going to talk more about that later, but anything transgenic, anything where you're adding a gene um, is very complicated through a number of regulatory agencies. More about the oxalate oxidase, uh, one of the regulatory agencies, the EPA, is very concerned that it's easy to identify anything transgenic, anything that, you know, we need to be able to identify. If you're looking at a tree that has the oxidase, the oxidase and one without, how can you tell? There's, you, visually, looking at the trees, there's nothing. But um, it turns out the oxidase, oxidase is unique because uh, we can do a little screening test where uh, anything that has oxalate oxidase present turns a blue-black color in this, in this particular solution, and then a control solution that doesn't turn color. Uh, wheat germ from the store triggers this test really uh, easily in just a couple hours. You see this, um, see this distinct coloration. You don't have to do any DNA tests to identify it. Uh, turns out banana, like I mentioned earlier, um, turns blue-black in this solution. So yes, there's oxalate oxidase in a banana. Um, and then a wheat germ test again. And then some of our leaf discs. We can just take a punch of the leaf, drop it in the solution. If it turns black on the edges, it has oxalate oxidase. So this is just a quick way to identify um, the presence of the gene. And this can't be done with other genes, say from Chinese chestnut. That would require a more uh, complex test. <clears throat> More about the regulatory agencies. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but basically the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA are all involved and all uh, have very rigorous standards that we're just starting to, uh, to kind of explore. <laughs> Everything is under a USDA permit that we're planting right now. That's very limited. That's only the few acres. And uh, before we can just release these, send them to anyone, uh, plant them out publicly or whatever, we need to get approval from, um, from all these three agencies.